As Andre mentioned, uh, I'm working as a freelance urban planner, but I started to understand I have better communication skills than designing skills. So I often work with municipalities, developers, architects, all kinds of activists when there is some reconstruction of public space. All these people want something. And we have to make sure they don't kill each other and the motivations are set right. So I'm the person following them through the process, designing everything, all sorts of communication. Uh, but part of this actually started, and you will see why, it's uh, gender and public spaces, because uh, it starts with a, a, a asymmetry of women, actually. There are many women here, but if you look at municipality, possibly it's the opposite, no, ratio. So you are doing a very interesting job, possibly in NGO, but you are not where the decisions are made, and this is a problem. Okay, so shortly who I am, Facilitator, networker, uh, researcher, I'm a very passionate walker, which tells me a lot about cities. Uh, I also will speak a little bit about Minsk. I'm feminist, born and bred on equitable urban planning. So I'm always moving around, but it's always in the city. This is mostly where I work, but with gender agenda, it seems Eastern countries are much more able to listen. I don't know why is it, but people are, you know, just want to know more. So I'm traveling like hell, uh, and now I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Uh, where does it all start? Uh, I live in Prague, uh, which is capital in Czech Republic. And in 2011, I came there as a student of Erasmus, and we knew that there is not enough of discussion about urban planning. All was considered to be only architecture, you know, objects. But what matters is the planning and the processes. So we decided to do a festival, which is called Recite, which will happen next week. Uh, it will be fifth year in Prague. So I was one of co-founder and leading coordinator. And we took the luxury to take the best brains from political sector, from architecture, from urban planning, NGOs, bring them to Prague. Prague at the time was like sleepy hollow. Nothing happens, you know, very post-Soviet communistic planning, nothing. But when we started to... <coughs> And you had big stars, you know, like uh, mayors of uh, New York, Bogota. Local politicians couldn't just sit in their offices, you know, like, like nothing is happening. They had to come to the festival, shake hands and listen to something, you know. And slowly this wave, because it was huge, it contributed uh, to somehow change. Uh, but over time, I start to pay attention to our panels. So you see them, I mean, like they are mostly black, you know, all these men in jackets. And I'm thinking, Jesus, it's urban planning. Urban planning calls it a city. City, at least 50% women. So why, why it's so black, you know? Slowly we started to have responses from embassies. Listen, you are speaking so progressively about urban planning. Why there are not enough of women on, on the panel? So, okay, it's true. But where are the women? You know, women architects. We started to... Uh, or came to the fact that there are no women architects. But I said, no, it's not like this. They are somewhere. Well, after like research, we found out they are mostly in NGO, education, research. I mean, it's all nice. But these professions are not considered to be the power professions. When it comes to decision, there are only men, architects, and people who work in municipalities and developers. These are men. So women are in a weak position, I would say, professionally. So even here, I understood that we were taking pictures and our speakers look like this, men. And not that I have something against men, but it was just how it was. While women architects were doing voluntary, you know, service uh, while giving registration tax. So think about this. I say something is wrong, you know. And then I went even further, and this is a part of research that we did uh, with the uh, Ministry of Education. So red line is a uh, number of women graduates from architecture, and uh, green is actually men, past 15 years in Czech Republic. In 2008, women started to be more active, and actually there were more women architects graduating. But when it comes to practice, in Czech Republic, it's only 22% of women active. So why is this, you know? Later on we can find out why. Anyway, so all of this puts you in a very uncomfortable position. Even I myself, with all these universities and traveling, suddenly, because I was in NGO, was started to call, like, you are the production manager. I said, no way, I'm not production manager. I'm program person contributing, I'm managing director, etc. And I will be present in decision making. So it started to affect me. And you know what affects you? It's the best reason actually to change things. So I 
left uh, Recite last year, and uh, when I started to speak about topic, maybe there, where are the women architects? I get thousands, uh, very, uh, like, a lot, a lot, a lot responses from women. You know, I have also the feeling I'm not earning a lot. I'm in the NGO. I am an architect by education, and I have some male director, but I, I, I'm never seen somewhere. Nobody invites me anywhere. Then I start to feel it's actually a structural problem, just like this. So, but this is just setting, you know, human infrastructure. Then you start to question, like, uh, architecture and gender, and mostly responses are architecture is gender neutral because architecture is for human being. And then you ask, who is a human being? You know, men, women, other genders, you know, like, and it's just not enough. So, let's come back, uh, why do we have this notion? Why ar uh, architecture is gender neutral? Why do we have these responses? Okay, first thing, I mean, like, uh, is it still gender neutral? I mean, whenever, uh, for example, women want to piss in public space, in some countries, it's really not a good idea, and there is no infrastructure. While men can have these pissoirs, even in Europe, you know, women are just left alone, so they have to go to coffee or somewhere else, or they just have to suffer. This is just the most extreme case. Mm -hmm. So there was one architectural studio from Sweden called Peace Better. They started to actually uh, design pissoirs for women for festivals, you know? And start, I'm just saying that there's one aspect to this. But... <coughs> You all know Neufeld, who is architect in here. This is the Bible of architecture, you know, human scales, etc. It's enormous, you know, you thousands of illustrations. But then again, there are only four situations where there is a woman as, as a human scale. And let's have a look where, where is she? She's at home doing housework. Okay, second, she's again in a kitchen, so we have measurements of the kitchen according to him, like women. Third, she is taking, okay, rest, but she's at home as well. So you see the chair and everything. And then again, she is actually preparing a bath for her husband. So, <laughs> Neufeld was brilliant, but I think he's a product of his era, you know? These are like, <laughs> this is another era where it was like this. So he was just copying whatever was lifestyle. And this is not our lifestyle. Today we are much more balanced. We are mostly freelancer. Feminism actually put us into position of more stronger, educated women. So why would we have to copy this? I mean, but this is something that we are still learning at the universities. Second thing, etiquette, you know, like, like bon ton. I am taking this picture and uh, uh, I suggest you go through it a little bit, that uh, women were designed to work differently on public space and behave differently. So this is just extra. Proper lady doesn't stop when she's walking on the street. She doesn't smile. And she doesn't look around while walking on the streets. Why? Because she would be considered a prostitute, you know, something like this. So she has to go very straight forward. And even this gentleman who is actually uh, helping her to go to the car is not because he's kind, but he has to protect the woman because she is not designed to be on public space, you know, she's too fragile. And this is still something going on a little bit, and now it's disappearing, you know, like we no longer uh, put the seats for women, maybe older women, but not the younger one, so it's going down. However, this is something that has been shaping our thinking about how women are working in public space or behaving, and how is it translated into architecture. Funny change comes for women because they were always in households, you know, doing uh, their, their stuff. Actually, with uh, uh, shopping malls and shopping like this, because women suddenly could come to city and do shopping. So it was the first time they were liberated and they could go outside. But it wasn't outside going for, you know, coffee with friends or anything like this, or artists, you know, all these debates. She would be going just to buy something for the household and then coming back. So, funny thing that women were actually something like architect, article or a client for actually business. But it put us out. Anyways, what I'm saying, we are part, uh, like uh, biased by something that was going on past century. And I'm not saying it's all bad, but it's important to realize. And architecture, as we are being taught, is not gender neutral at all. You have seen just one example. But what is important, urban planning, now how it's done, it's influencing life of everyone in form of transportation, 
residences, polyfunctions, everything. And certain groups are benefiting, I, would, I wouldn't say significantly more, but significantly less. Women, I'm not speaking about other gender, uh, well, let's say groups, homeless people, immigrants, etc., etc. We can go like this, on and on. So there is certain bias and uh, gaps in our profession. So I'm coming now, or like we all go slightly south, Vienna, you know, <coughs> one of those best cities for life, always ranking top. Prague wants to be competitor to this, like second biggest. So uh, they actually started with a policy of gender mainstreaming. I think it's important to say what is gender mainstreaming as a definition. It's actually policy which, try, which is trying to actually put equal chances for men and women, not only in urban planning. It was actually a precondition of European Union starting in the 90s, where it had to be applied. And Vienna took it really seriously. And it actually put it also into urban planning. So uh, gender mainstreaming, and I'm not saying only men and women, but uh, this is all sorts of men and women in different ages. So I like this picture very much. And it's Vienna. So let's go there. First introduction. Vienna is actually slightly uh, smaller than Minsk, 1.7 million people. It has 23 municipal districts. It's a relatively green city uh, with uh, relatively few open spaces in the uh, central part. Uh, it has really extensive and efficient public transportation, really good. And 60% of inhabitants live in subsidized social housing. So that is why it's also one of the best cities uh, where you don't see this group, you know, like ghetto, you know, like borders. Demographic prognosis, you know, like all these immigrants didn't go to Slovakia, didn't go to your country, didn't go to Czech Republic, they went to Vienna because it was there. And it's a very actually friendly, you know, you go to website and you find it in at least six different languages, so it's welcoming. So it's, uh, they are expecting population boom. As for gender mainstreaming, uh, it was applied in many policy, including urban planning. But it, it wasn't like self-evident, okay, we have European Union policy. They had to have people who were fighting for this. So we'll go through this as well. Okay, now facts. Why did they start to actually question Neufeld, you know, and all these things that I showed you? Uh, first, they started in the 90s, where they did a huge survey. How do people use public transport? And it seems that men were very quick with responses, and women couldn't stop writing. This is the first thing like, where they realized, well, what's, that's interesting. So let, let's have a look at the results. So uh, this blue thing, you see men and women. Women are using public transportation more. They are also work, uh, walking more, if you look at the green part. And they are driving less than men. And if they are driving, they are more in position of passenger than the driver. Yesterday we had a conversation with Andre that uh, transportation is really gender, let's say, biased because women, due to salaries, cannot afford to have cars, so they use public transport while men usually can afford and they go to work. It's true. Okay. Second thing, how does all of this relate to unpaid work? This is really important because we live with certain lifestyle. And this lifestyle is affecting us. So let's have a look at paid working hours. Men are 76% paid of their time, while women only 46%. Why? Because they mostly care about household works and kids. So it's still, in, even in our country, women stay at home with children. She does this, you know, she has this double shift, while men is still this breadwinner. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just like, uh, like it is. So, if we take it and expand it, I would say it's not male-female uh, trajectory because uh, now it can be any kind of person that is single. So, for example, my uh, pattern is like this. I don't have children and I travel a lot. So, it's usually workplace, shopping and home. But if I would be caring about someone, whether my children or uh, somebody, I would have to do more, you know, routes around. So it's nursery, part-time job, school, I'm re relative shopping. So out of this, people in Vienna realize women are having much more complex trajectory than men over the city. And they are actually the biggest client and biggest consumer of public space. It con con made up to 75% versus 25% of men. So they're thinking, okay, we have to start to think about this and how do we make this public space safe for them or even comfortable. 
So there were the questions. <clears throat> As they went further on, they realized it's not only men, women question, but it's also a question of age. And as you see, all these colorful parts, except of the red, are people of certain ages. So they find out 40% uh, are kids, teenagers, seniors, which is quite a lot in Vienna, actually. Uh, and when we have a look at this, it seems like everything we do is just designed for people who are working. You know? So, you know this place? Uh, I would like to just summarize this part of the lecture. In daily life, women are the ones who do most of the care-related works, whether for a household or for the children or for the older people. So, as you see on, the, on this picture, women, she's carrying these bags. I love it. Second, you know this picture possibly? In daily life, women use public transport more and walk more compared to men, even in Minsk. Uh, I'm here for the day, I'm observing like crazy, still. There are these patterns. I'd like to pinpoint a third, uh, third thing. Uh, this is actually a huge controversy because uh, in BBC last year uh, they were preparing a program, uh, important Brits who changed the history. And uh, one program was uh, dedicated to architecture. So you see all these architects. But what's wrong with this picture is that original picture was like this. And they decided to Photoshop this woman out. She was wife of this gentleman with pink, pink, you know, they were even somehow color matching. But because she was his wife, she was equal architect, they just took the name of the husband and just dropped her out. But it, I mean, they're all dead, like, like this couple. So they were saying, like, how is this possible? Because we were uh, working together. So I'm saying, like, in competition about public space, about profession, women need strong representation in profession and decision making because it can happen even in Britain, in BBC, that you will be photoshopped out. And now let's come to urban planning. How it all began, like, uh, in Vienna. So I told you it was research, and then because uh, people who were doing this research started to be actually uh, really interested in this, they did a workshop. And uh, they were asking different types of women, Turkish women, women who is like a Austrian woman who is young woman. Like, how does your everyday uh, life look like? It's 90s, you know, it seems to us very self-evident. They came up with the exhibition who owns the public space. So on every panel you could see how does the woman of this group use the, uh, the city. In the end, it created huge controversies, but in a positive way, because city councillors st uh, started to be aware that something is wrong. So the next year, they started uh, or they designed a uh, women department. You know, you have women department. I mean, can you imagine this women department in urban planning section? Impressive. So they hired only women to study specifically needs of women. Over time, if it grew into other groups as well. So, in 98, there was coordination office for planning with special regards of needs for women. So, they created structure within their city hall. So, this is where it's important because then you can make decisions. Anyways, uh, this is a little bit harder to read, but uh, I'm going to show you some themes and topics that Vienna was able to actually implement it. Because this is a story of 25, 26 years now, so it looks very fast. But I like to give you an uh, example. So, some projects from gender-sensitive housing, gender-sensitive parks and mobility, gender-sensitive and safe public spaces, public housing uh, and uh, urban development. Uh, they always start with huge analysis and research. They conducted over 60, they still call it pilot projects. I don't know if you can call yourself pilot after 25 years of practice, but they are maybe too modest. They developed a series of manuals uh, which are actually online in English that you can really download, planning recommendations. And uh, whenever there is a competition, because they do a lot of competitions, they always require a certain quota of women architects, for example. So let's have a look. Uh, gender sensitive housing, this is a very interesting project in three phases, uh, Frauenwerkstatt, which means women uh, work in the city. And it was actually created like proposal to do residential housing because they found out there are, let's say, more women seniors, and they ask only women architects, the competition only for women architects, like, uh, can you actually design a house which would accommodate needs of women only? Yes, uh, it went popular. 
after they were convincing, you know, some women uh, that they can participate. But uh, they found out, for example, that they need, for example, higher ceilings, more light, more communal spaces. Uh, it's not only flat, 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 and a corridor. It's more about interaction and then space. Uh, I suggest you take a look uh, uh, at Frauen Werkstatt. Now they are preparing fourth project. You know. So it was for them a good prototype, actually, how to think about community. In one of those, actually this one, it's in 21st district, uh, they made also special rule, only woman can be owner of the flat, I mean, not men. Not that they don't like men, but they realize like a female are usually I mean, like less uh, or more dependent on men. So when, for example, dies or something is with the salary, she stays without anything. So they actually provided them with the flats. I mean, they, men can live there as well, but she should be the owner. So you see how they are thinking about this. Gender sensitive uh, aspect can be reflected also, not that we need bigger lighting, but sometimes uh, these are all the groups and all life phases that you can go through, whether you are single or with your partner or with children of certain age or you live with your grandmother or grandfather. What is interesting, the flat unit is the same size always, but you can still remove uh, these actually walls so they are not permanent. I was always questioning this when I was, I, I was living also in panel housing, mass housing, and it all looked the same. And sometimes I would feel squeezed and sometimes I would need more space or anything like this. So they just make it the way that you can actually move. And it is a very simple thing that you can do. And this is also gender sensitive. And now we are not speaking only about men and women, but men and women of different ages. So, very easy. Second thing, gender sensitive parks and playgrounds especially. That was a huge opener also for people from Vienna because uh, they realized due to blocks, they have these small children playgrounds inside of the blocks, and most of this is consumed by this playground for football or basketball. And what they find out, they are always like boys. So the general assumption is um, young girls, are, they don't need to play outside. You know, they are chit-chatting somewhere, you know, especially between age 9 and 12, they found out girls are just disappearing from public space. They are nowhere to see. So they are still thinking, but is it true that they are nowhere? So for one day, what they did was they closed down all these playgrounds for boys and said, now it's for girls only. And the reactions were like, parents were protesting, like, come on, this is not natural. What are you doing? Like, this is, what? Shocking. And uh, what they found out, suddenly once uh, boys left, there were girls playing volleyball, actually. So it had to be just tested whether this stereotype was right or wrong. And then they found out between age of 9 and 12, whatever, girls and boys tend to have these clashes. So if you would be a girl with three of your friends and there would be boys playing football, would you actually dare to go inside and say, listen, boys, next hour is mine? I mean, they just don't have the courage. And this is was why we have to be sensitive. So we have to provide a space. So what they did after, they realized if they are building a new park, it should be so huge that it can accommodate boys and girls because they will not share the same space. And this is uh, just coming from the psychology. So this is one of uh, examples, is Rudolf Bednar Park uh, in Vienna. But before they started to actually uh, do social scientific survey, again, to have the data, uh, it's called Full Play with Opportunities. Again, three years after this specific regard, girls should go to public space was adapted into strategic plans. So you see, because of the coordination office by women, it went mm -hmm. up. And then uh, they designed six model parks with in participation with girls as well. So it looks like pretty huge. So let's uh, have a look. It has certain elements. So huge lawns for any kind of game. This is actually uh, something like stage. Then there is skate park, which is entirely like boys, for example. And uh, the thing is not to make something special for women or like girls, but just to make such spaces where you can have all these activities which will not disturb each other. And when you think about this, uh, if you have children playground, it's working well for girls and boys up till the age of maybe five. But then again, you have only facilities which are for boys, for example. So in the end, uh, it was a very actually successful prototype of this. And again, it's not about extra construction for women, but how do you distribute the space? 
that was actually my opener for me as well. Like gender sensitive public spaces or safe public spaces. If you want to pretend or like if you want to get someone on your side and you have this gender agenda, just say it will be safer because safety is very universal and pusher. So uh, they were experimenting or started to ex uh, do experiments with gender mainstreaming on cemeteries. And I know you'll give me this look like, what? What are you talking about? Like, why cemeteries? Because everyone is dead there. Why would we, you know, accommodate needs of men and women? Everyone's dead. And then again, this woman coordination office came up <coughs> with statistics, but who is actually visiting cemeteries the most? And these are women and widows coming actually to see their husbands or relatives. So, for they design actually special things, because women are usually shorter and smaller, then the benches have to be also a little bit lower, because it's not comfortable for them. Water facilities have to be like much more complex. Orientation signs have to be, and type, types have to be bigger, because they have problems with seeing, you know, and entries have to be also enlightened. And these are very, very small things actually to apply, but it can increase the quality of their life, even on cemeteries, much better. So, uh, other thing is with lighting. So they apply this policy everywhere, and then they, where do we feel unsafe? Especially women feel unsafe, like much more than men actually. So, of course, uh, it could be a crossroads, but then again, under this kind of highways, I guess you have them as well. So if you would be going under and there is no light, you would possibly avoid this. Then again, public lighting in a park, not only on footpaths, but for example, on places like where you actually may stop. So benches or bicycle stands. So you don't want to just go into the dark, you know, because it feels unsafe. So uh, they were also thinking about where to put the light, for example. Third uh, was actually gender sensitive mobility. So now another mind opener. And this was after like maybe 20 years of practice. It's not a question only about men and women, but now it's also age and ethnicity, etc. This is very nice, actually, infographics that you see in a subway in, v uh, in Vienna, because it displays equally like uh, old men, old women, I mean, uh, disabled or someone who needs help, but also women with child, but also men with child, you know? And this is actually the subliminal message we are sending somewhere else. And out of this, actually, they find out uh, they would be doing uh, this regulation, you know, this information, like, dear passengers, please go away. They actually uh, said, we want everyone to feel safe in here, so the language turned very comfortable, you see. Uh, like, uh, house rules. So if you go to Vienna and you see these uh, rules, it's called house rules. So it feels like, okay, I'm entering something common, you know. And then again, because we want to all stay here comfortable, please don't do this. With respect, your Wiener Linien. And gender sensitivity accelerated so much that they even made the language so smooth that you would feel like, okay, this is maybe part of my home or I feel good in here. Uh, so uh, subway uh, A-line is completely gender mainstream. And now it feels like uh, we can think about this, but what can really influence quality of life or can be obstacle for men and women, especially older and younger? How do you actually design time and space for supply? Like everything. Station design. Is the station seen from the distance? I mean, like how uh, easy it's, uh, is it to actually access? Then info stands. And stalls are important, where you can actually get the information, so you can have leaflets, for example. Then again, dynamic information, whatever is going up there, it has to be with a phone that is visible, again, for older and young, young people. Elevators and escalators are a must. I'm sure you also, I mean, you have wonderful stairs in here, but I wouldn't like to carry a baby carrier up there, not even move with something else. <laughs> so this is really important. Cars with low entry are also important, so you don't have to walk, you know, tram up there because it's not very comfortable. Also, enough of storage place, you can guess why. If you are, let's say, uh, with less uh, mobility or if you are with baby carrier, their end conditioning. Possibly you have heard that women are more fragile towards cold and the offices with the temperature how are designed right now are for men. You know, so women are mostly to get cold. So they are thinking maybe air conditioning shouldn't be so strong in our subway. So this is very tiny detail. Then cleanness, of course. Women are much less likely to enter the 
car, which is dirty and smells, you know, ten men, you know, something is working like this. I just came from Japan, and uh, in subway, uh, they are specially designed trains for women, not only because of sexual harassment, but also because of all these aspects. Uh, and then paths for blind and disabled, whether are they men or uh, women, uh, doesn't matter. But uh, then again, it's only you know after they started this uh, speech about gender. And then let's go to actually level of let's say district. How these things can be applied on level of neighborhoods? Here it starts to be interesting. So Maria Hilfer district is uh, one of those central districts, very small but it has this Maria Hilfer Strasse Boulevard, which is something like Times Square for, for in Vienna conditions. So it's Main Street and uh, all these, you know, ac actors, directors, museum quarty. It's one of those hip places. And it's also ruled by Green Party, which I have to say, Green Party was really, you know, listening to what these people were saying. So they decided, actually, they would uh, conduct the study, Fair Shared City. Again, we have the study. Uh, and we will focus on needs of pedestrians and residents, all sorts of gender, all sorts of age. So you see it like here. After everything I told to you until now, we can actually broaden or widen these uh, uh, goals into broader sidewalks. Now with the, the picture you can mm -hmm. see why it's important also for women. Barrier freeness, so we should remove all these fences or un unnecessary Construction, safe crossing. This is really important uh, also for men or women, but now the age plays a role. Traffic lights. This is really important. Can a child reach the traffic light? Because this is something that we don't think about, really. And uh, it's important for them because they also start to do maps because children are still walking to the schools alone. So each school gives their students a map, like where they uh, should go, and they are designing uh, their, this is potentially a negative place or where you can be harmed. So kids with the map know where to go. So especially that is why it has to be actually uh, within their reach. Safety, we spoke about light a little bit. Good conditions, surface are really important. I mean, and uh, in gender it plays a lot. And then sidewalk coffee. I haven't seen so many coffee places here in, uh, on the street, but I think it's a question of years when your city center starts to be flooded with these pop-up coffees and you know, and they will consume the sidewalks. I mean, you have fairly wide sidewalks, but still it can go unregulated. In Vienna, which is number one city where everyone goes if they're traveling to Central Europe, has so many tourists. So coffee places started to actually really occupy the space of the sidewalk. So they made regulation, at least one and a half meter has to be space. So this is something else to consider. And it's coming from actually like application of gender mainstreaming principles. First, you have to know where to put these things or where to work with these things. So up there, uh, there is uh, examples of GIS supported district maps. Uh, those yellow, uh, red ones are actually uh, sidewalks which are more or less narrow than two meters. And with two meters, you know, imagine yourself with this and this and kids and I don't know. It's not that comfortable to walk. So they did audit and analyze. And then of all the street elements, from lighting, crossing, etc. And then if you have this, then you can think, okay, what can be changed? But let's go back to people because it's always about the people. Because they are very good in participation and they are aware that each group has different needs. They will also uh, start to make typology out of these people. So for this uh, project, they did typology of potential user. So whom do we have? So there is a woman with, uh, let's say, or young young mother with a child. There is a businessman. There is actually a young father with the child who may be living in the district. Uh, there is uh, actually a woman that is actually working in kindergarten because it's actually quite residential. Then there are some uh, young people or teenagers or like say yuppies. Then there is a, a school girl that is going, for example, to piano lesson after the school. Then there we have uh, all the women and then again there is a male who is w w going to work. What I like about these characters, they are emerging out of their own demography. It's not just downloaded somewhere from New York or Copenhagen or whatever. We have obsession just to copy. They know who is living in the district. 
and then uh, they even start to make uh, their pathways. So if you want to describe it to either urban planners who have no idea, like why would we do this, try to put a character, send him on the road and explain his road. And also you can do it to public, then public will understand why it's important. So they try to put uh, these characters into the specific places, explaining this is a critical moment, here we don't have a space, this is collision, etc. etc. And out of this uh, uh, came this kind of narrative, so I'm just taking a print screen of each and uh, every one of them. So we have a child that is going from this piano lesson and there is a corner, she doesn't see behind, so that's why we have to put the mirror, you know. And they told me that you don't have mirrors in Minsk, I don't know why. I don't know why, but uh, it's actually a useful element. Or this is like uh, self-evident that the lady has to have really better access, uh, uh, which is free. And also why the sidewalk has to be wider, of course. But the question is how do they actually move around the district? And then the transformation seems like acupuncture, you know, nothing major, you know, no big boulevard, nothing. But it's all about details. So they added street crossings, I think it was around 42 or something. Pedestrian friendly traffic lights again moving down, enlarging pavements where it was uh, really necessary, add some more lightning, barrier free pavements, additional sitting, and that was it. You know? And it didn't cost that much money, but uh, the impact was huge. So I'm coming to actually uh, the end of the lecture, as now, <coughs> that me speaking, you listening, hopefully it's the other way. Uh, with this, uh, I spent in Vienna one month uh, last summer and it just made sense, absolute sense in my mind that I have to come back to Prague and I have to speak about these things. Because we have a huge institute of planning and development with mostly young people and we are like, very eager to actually do whatever we can to actually compete with Vienna. And, uh, but we are not very gender sensitive. In, in fact, all this feminist stuff, all this uh, LGBT, whatever, people just don't hear. And again, we have a lot of actually male architects in there who had never experienced this kind of question. So I don't blame them, but the awareness is not there. So of course, uh, because of my previous connection from Recite and uh, other connection, I started uh, to speak with Institute of Planning and we made agreement that manual for public spaces will be uh, like, you know, plug in gender layer. So let's have a look in every single element how it can actually be applied for which, uh, which users. So they were kind of uh, open, but still uh, with the first lecture, when we had on this topic, there were like 60 people, 55 women and five men. And I spent 90 minutes just explaining, women don't have any kind of magic solution or trick, uh, but this question has to be open for all of them because they always ask, so what is a special need that you have? It's just democracy, you know? And then expanding into other groups. Then again, it's really interesting then to look, for example, how would gays, lesbians, immigrants be moving around the city because of safety and their cultural needs. How much um, do we know about women and how much do we know about them, actually? This is, uh, and we are missing data. Okay, but what went really well is uh, that the next manual that came out, this is Manual for Participation in Prague, which tells you like uh, what kind of, let's say, format you use in kind of, uh, what kind of actually uh, stage of uh, participation. It's also, you can download it. The previous one is also in English, so you can download it as well. Uh, it went well because uh, they started to speak about more target groups. So it's not only just residents, but suddenly these are old people, mom or fathers with baby carriers, people with dogs, uh, school girls, etc. And it's important for you as an expert to implement this language. It's not only public, it's not residents, but these are specific groups. In this uh, participatory uh, or manual of participation, we use masculine and feminine in the language. And it's really important because uh, I, I just uh, somehow I'm blooming from the fact if I meet a woman architect and she says I'm a male architect, if you know this architect, architect. And somehow it's part of the subliminal message that we are sending. And then again, we start to do užívatel, užívatelki. I don't care if it's like longer, but it's democratic, so we should be doing this as well. So we did it in this manual as well. We also started to uh, put different pictures where there are not only men deciding, you know, jackets, but also women as decision makers or part of the group. And this is also important message that you are sending. How do you display these groups? 
and then again uh, the participation office is actually uh, mixed like we have men and women I don't know about other gender groups right now but uh, we are not so open about these things at least it's not a bunch of uh, men or a bunch of women just coming to some kind of public meeting and doing the talk. It's a very actually diverse and also different ages, so it feels natural. So I'm just going to show you, uh, for example, you can see what kind of formats, etc. And here is uh, like a meeting. And we have also men and women in there, so it feels like natural. And then again, women is actually deciding. She has this gesture which says something like, I'm saying something important. This is also important. So, if I have to wrap it up and somehow uh, to send some kind of message to Minsk or any other country that has no idea or didn't have experience with this, I would say, know your users. Just don't assume you know people who are living in the district because you will never know. So, uh, try to invest into sociological research first. Do research because you then have, you have data backup and you can do argument with this. Uh, second, if you try to actually uh, start with gender, it's a big opener. But then again, try to actually layer it with age, social, economical, ethnical classes. And what you will get are very different groups uh, of people who will have very different needs. So it's not enough just to play with the term of public or even gender. We have to go further. And then know their needs. Because uh, workers will have different needs than school people, uh, you know, some kind of actually you know, like families or strong families, maybe Russians will have different needs because they are so strongly connected. You know, there are always some things. Try to actually work with these target groups. If you don't know them, and I know even we struggle, like uh, our public administration struggle, like why, how can I connect? We have like huge groups of Vietnamese people living in Czech Republic, and we consider them like uh, silent or mute faces because they are only doing these 24 hour shops for low money and they are never complaining. So we assume everything is okay, but it's not okay. So let's try to pick up someone from their community, for example, from second generation who can speak Czech and then we can work with them. And uh, in this, I see huge potential for uh, public sector to work with NGO. Yesterday I was in this uh, courtyard that your colleague was doing uh, in a working area, designing first playground. I was amazed how it went, you know, and I assume that these workers are not that inactive uh, in the end, or what they did. But uh, maybe in this case, it was proven that uh, nothing would be changed without your actually help, because you decided to go there, know the people, and somehow make connection between public uh, municipality and NGO. In this case, uh, I like to see NGO representatives not as anarchists fighting against, but people who have the knowledge and you know the local chemistry so they can connect with people and I think it's important to send this message from the public sector we are cooperating we are not fighting against each other we have to use our resources together why because it will increase the quality of life for everyone and this is what we want to achieve no anyway so this is number three and uh, four uh, let's have more women experts in let's say uh, public administration and decision making uh, let's guaranteed rest assured that uh, women with certain experiences will never allow sidewalk uh, like more, more narrow than 1.5 meters because she knows. So uh, even in Prague we tend to forget about this fact and I'm not saying these six men who are doing strategic plan age 35 all single, their life experience is bad. It's not bad but it's totally not uh, uh, encompassing everyone who is living in Prague. So try to put more women and then different age I think you will have just more diverse opinions and it will result in a better, better, better plans. So, for this uh, we started to actually, uh, I call it project, but it's like my sole project. It's called Women Public Space in Prague, where we actually did a database first as a response. Uh, do we have women experts that could be sent or invited for conferences, etc. We found out that there are more than 100 of them. So slowly we are building database, we are doing interviews with them and we ask about how they work, even in NGO, is related to urban planning and try to give them more visibility. And slowly as we are moving and we are quite, let's say, respected even as young women, we always try to make an open doors, whatever meeting is there, 
we try to add more women, so advocate for them, because then it gets more interesting. So we uh, also, on this website, you can find some more research or uh, some kind of uh, links, and uh, the database will be working hopefully this uh, summer. Uh, or this is also a way how to stay in touch. So I think I said a lot, so I would say this is my final question. What do you feel about this? Thank you.